All righty, welcome to Sycamore 201. I'm going to go ahead and open us up with prayer. <clears throat> now, Father God, thank you for your word. Thank you, Lord, that you've given us your word, that we might know your truth. We pray, Lord, that as we come to open your Bible up and learn more about it, that you would change us, grow us, help us, Lord, to see how your Bible meant, it wants to be read so we can know you more. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, see, this is why we need doors, because what, what, what we're doing in here is just as valid as what they're doing out there. We don't want to stop them either, so we need doors. Anyway, yes. It's got to stop, exactly. It's got to stop. Yes, and just in case you, Mike, as a joke, is trying to spread the rumor that I purposely miscommunicated and may, I made the doors go away because I don't want doors. He's a lying liar and smells like smoke, just so you know, okay? It's not true. Mike is making that up. So. All right, so here's how we're going to do this. Sycamore 201, because we had to keep having delays, we only have two more classes left, but there are more Sundays in May, so there's no adult Sunday school the very last Sunday, because that's going to be a holiday weekend, and the Sunday school powers of be just said, don't worry about it. So we have two more classes of this, and then the final two Sundays, what I'm going to do is I'm going to kind of go over, um, back in the fall, I, when we kind of talked about the new vision of the church, or the updated vision, kind of had a presentation I did for Sunday school leaders and community group leaders. I'm going to share that presentation with you guys, and have an inter interaction about the kind of the, the genesis of the church's vision years and years and years ago, and kind of the updating over the last year. So if you want to, if you kind of want to know what the church is about, where we're going behind the scenes, you are going to want to come see that. And then the final Sunday will be sort of a passion project of mine that in a different life, I was trying to decide if the Lord was calling me into academic life as I should actually get a PhD, or if he's calling me into pastoral ministry, and I already had my PhD topic picked out and had done some research. And so I'm going to do, give you a very hopefully entertaining and engaging version of what I was going to make a PhD topic at one point in my life. So, and I'll even let you have it for free if you want to use it yourself. It's fine. So, anyway. Okay. Sycamore 201, how the Bible wants to be read. So we've been doing this class about biblical theology, which is a proper name, not a description. We're not saying all other theologies are unbiblical. Okay, no, not doing that at all. This is how the Bible wants to be read, how if God is truly as sovereign and providential as we believe he is, if, in, if inerrancy and authority of the inspiration are as robust as we say they are, then there's going to be things in there that show us by the very nature of what God's word is like. So these are how God wants us to see his word, primarily using Luke 24 to start out with, where Jesus is on the road to Emmaus. We read that as part of worship two weeks ago. If you remember, Jesus has these disciples of his. They followed him for years. They're mourning his death. They're walking along the road, all mopey, and gentle Jesus, meek and mild, comes up to them. He doesn't put his arm around them like, oh, y'all, be okay, I'm back. He rebukes them and says, you should have been able to know from the Old Testament itself about my death and resurrection. This is pretty intense, vain, right? And so based on that primary presupposition, this class has been kind of like, well, how could we have... How could we do that? Having, we have the complete Bible. We have the Holy Spirit. If we can't do it, no one else can, right? So we've been going through and seeing how the Bible itself has shown it really is all about Jesus. So last week, we ended in Revelation 21. We talked about um, this vision for the new heavens and new earth and the heavenly city. This was, gosh, three weeks ago, I believe, so I don't know. I'm reviewing here. And the new Jerusalem coming down from heaven. It's a picture of eternity on earth in bodies fulfilling the cultural mandate. So from Dante and a lot of medieval literature, we bringing back Greek paganism, we for generations have defaulted to heaven is misty, ethereal, up there somewhere, right? From scripture, Eschewing Greek paganism, we get no, heaven comes down, and we're in bodies on real estate for eternity. So that's one of the main presuppositions we have to kind of get away from this, is that we were always meant to be in bodies, and that eternity will be embodied. And that Jesus, as in his glorified body, is the first fruits of the eternity awaiting us. And so we see in, in the, at the end of the book of Revelation, Jerusalem, heaven, comes down and floods life and remakes the entire earth. So... 
Cultural mandate, those last two words there, what's that? It's only rhetorical if you don't answer it. So. <laughs> Anybody remember that one? Cultural mandate? Okay, it's from Genesis, yep. From, let's, go, let's do the text, maybe this will help us. So then I, this is from Revelation 21. Then I saw a new heaven and new earth, for the first heaven and first earth had passed away and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them, and they will be his people. God himself will be with them as their God. Okay, so the cultural mandate, kind of shown here, but it's from Genesis, where the Lord said, if I started, but you can finish it, be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth, and subdue it. That's right. So that's given before the fall. So the mandate was for humans was to go and do stuff in my name as my image bearers. Go and do stuff. Build things, invent things, make things beautiful, garden, do all sorts of stuff in my name. And we see that the best of that will be in the new heavens and new earth as well. So, but here's where I really want to kind of land as we start today. So verse 3. Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them and they will be his people and God himself will be with them as their God. The dwelling place is the Greek word for tabernacle in the Greek version of the Old Testament, which is the Bible the New Testament would have used. Most of the Christians in the New Testament were reading a Greek version of the Old Testament. They would have seen this. And say, hey, that's the word for tabernacle in Exodus 25. So God is saying that the tabernacle will now be with people. So what he's telling us right here in Revelation, kind of why I'm starting out here as a review, is this tent in Exodus where God met with his people was a shadow of this reality. This is what it looked forward to, God coming down and actually being with his people. Now, if you're paying attention, there's another place in the New Testament where we see that God dwells, actually uses the word tabernacle with his people. Anybody know where it is? On one, that's right. It says Jesus Christ himself tabernacled among us. So even more profoundly, the Bible tells us that this tent in the Old Testament is actually a foreshadowing of Jesus Christ himself. That he was the first fruits, the foretaste, the appetizer of God dwelling with his people and that this revelation picture is the reality. So this is the way we trace themes all through the Bible. We take it very seriously because they could have used different words. Why under inspiration are they saying he built his tent? They want us to understand these things. So that's what kind of what biblical theology is about. So today, I'm going to look at kind of this idea of the tent. So Leviticus chapter 26, verse 11 and 12. I have most of this on the slide. If you really want to turn there in your own Bibles, go ahead. But we're not going to wait for you ever so respectfully. So <laughs> says, I will make my dwelling among you, and my soul shall not abhor you. And I will walk among you and be your God, and you shall be my people. What an incredible promise, right? God comes to his people in Leviticus and says, I'm going to be among you. My soul shall not abhor you. This is the setup to giving them the tabernacle. Isn't that a great idea? Because we, we see the tabernacle as just a, a place. Uh, we kind of, in my mind, when I read it, I bet you're probably the same you read things about the Old Testament tabernacle, the Old Testament temple, and you think kind of like church. That's the place they go to do the worship thing, like we go to do worship, right? But notice how this is reversed. God says, no, this is the place where I come to you. That's a, that's a totally different picture here. See, Revelation 21 uses the imagery of the tabernacle and temple, the structures that symbolize God's presence with Israel now applied to all in Jesus as the ultimate blessing of eternity. So the ultimate blessing of eternity is what? That we will be with God. Another part of Revelation says, though, there's no need for a temple. Remember why? It says, because we are his temple. This is what it means when it says, you, y'all, you, not singular you, y'all are the temple of God. The Holy Spirit dwells in y'all, it's plural. Peter says, as living stones, you are being built up to the presence of God. We're going to be so closely with God, united to him in eternity, that we are actually his dwelling place 
in reality, there is no need of a tabernacle temple because we're so united to Jesus by faith. We are now in Jesus. God is in us in eternity. These are such profound, big concepts. You, you, should, be, you should be going, yeah, but what? Because we, we can't get our mind wrapped all around this. <clears throat> the worldwide effect of God's dwelling promise from Leviticus 26 has been expounded in Ezekiel. We kind of saw this before, but we'll go there a little bit more. So God says, one day, someday, in Leviticus, we think he's only talking about the temple, but because Jesus used temple or tabernacle language, and Revelation does, we know actually the Holy Spirit, even back then, was talking about something yet to come. The tabernacle was just a shadow of, of this reality. The reality is that God's worldwide dwelling with his people, all the way back in Leviticus 26. And it's expanded in Ezekiel, where Ezekiel says this, They shall dwell in the land that I gave to my servant Jacob, where your fathers lived. They and their children and their children's children shall dwell there forever. And David, my servant, shall be their prince forever. I will make a covenant of peace with them. It shall be an everlasting covenant with them. And I will set them in their land and multiply them. And I will set my sanctuary in their midst forevermore. My dwelling place shall be with them and I will be their God and they shall be my people. Then the nations will know that I am the Lord who sanctifies Israel when my sanctuary is in their midst forevermore. Right, yeah, it's true. Let's fire it up. Guys, what an amazing promise. So God is dwelling with them. God's dwelling with them is the blessing. It is the goal. It's the peace at the foundation of the covenant of peace in verse 26 is God dwelling with his people. We've said this before, but just to kind of keep, make sure we're, you're still paying attention. Peace, Old Testament. What's it mean? Shalom. Shalom, okay, what's that mean? It's not the cessation of hostility, right? What is it? It's uh, love and, and cooperation and wanting the very best for the other person. Yeah, love, cooperation, wanting the very best. Yeah, it's wholeness might be, it means whole. So kind of, okay, how do we make that make sense? It's wholesomeness, health, being undivided. Remember in the Psalms, you see that all, give me an undivided heart, Lord. A divided heart is the opposite of a heart of peace. A peaceful heart is whole, it's one. Whereas the book of James said, don't be double-minded and unstable in all your ways. A, a person who has peace is not double-minded. They're singular. So the covenant of peace is God comes and says, I'm going to fix your crazy. I'm going to fix all these multiple loves you have that, t that tear your personality apart, that you feel yourself. We, and we use that, right? I feel like I'm torn in different directions. Right? Paul says, what's wrong with me? This, this guy inside wants to do this. This other guy wants to do this. I'm like, Lord, help. That's all. You need peace. And God here says, I'm going to give you peace. I'm going to actually come, and in the covenant of peace, I'm going to just make you right. What an amazing promise. So we have this theme of God's dwelling, which is no longer organic as it was in Eden. What do you think I mean by that? He was like right there in Eden, right? God walked with us. He was right there in Eden. It was organic. They walked with him in the cool of the day. But now, instead of being organic, God's presence with us is mediated. Things stand between us and God to help bridge that gap. So we have the tabernacle was a mediation of God's presence, right? The temple was a mediation of God's presence. Jesus, obviously, was a mediation of God's presence. And now, the Holy Spirit is the mediation of God's presence. We have God with us because the Holy Spirit is in us. But one day, someday, Ezekiel has this promise in other places we do that we will get to have God back organically with us. We will have the immediate presence of God instead of the immediate presence of God. And that is what will bring you peace. That's heaven on earth. See, this is the Old Testament picture before the Greeks came in and messed us all up with Aristotle and Plato saying, well, Reality and spirit are different. Always keep them separate and stuff. And we, we all know that reality is bad, but spirit's good. Way before all that Greek stuff happened, we have the Old Testament saying, no, in bodies, with God organically, his immediate presence is what you want. And so Revelation skips over all that Greek influence in the Roman world and grabs onto this and says, yes, we're going to be with God immediately, organically with us. That's heaven on earth. So, in the garden, God's presence was so palpable that there was no need for a temple. Or to put it another way, the whole garden was a temple. 
In the same way, John imagines the new creation as a city that has no temple, but is itself a temple. Moving on with this quote, its cubic shape imitates the cubic shape of the temple's most holy place, the place most symbolic of God's presence. And the jasper, emerald, carnelian, and gold are reminiscent of the Garden of Eden, which was located in a place rich with precious minerals and metals. So you notice that you have these bookends to the Bible is what he's saying. You have this beautiful picture of God's presence as bookends to make it all about Jesus. You have, that's why we have creation, fall, redemption, restoration is brought back. This is how you read the Bible. Okay, again, this is class 10 of nine things that have come before, so we're kind of wrapping up some big themes, reminding you how, what are some of the big picture ways to read the scripture. We, we've done a few specific tracings of things, and we'll, we'll, we might do some more of those, but I'm trying to get you as a review. Here's the big picture of how we read the Bible. So, so we've traced another theme. Yeah, go ahead, yeah. Was the very last thing you said? The last, last couple of words, a different place. Gotcha. Yeah, it's not a different place. Yeah, it does, doesn't? Because the change is going to be so dramatic that when, when heaven comes down, it's a new heavens and a new earth. It's going to completely eradicate all the sin in, in such a way that it might as well be a recreation. In the same way that you know, I don't, I don't want to fall off the map here, but in the same way, like if the Bible's true. Noah's flood was almost a complete recreation of things. If that actually happened, I believe it did. If a worldwide flood actually happened, it recreated everything in such a way that all the supposed geological evidence and stuff, we don't know anything before Noah's flood. It changed everything, right? We, we know geology goes back to Noah's flood, but it's a different planet because it was such a massive recreation. And so, too, what he's saying is that the reality that's coming is so different. That it, it's, it's a complete recreation. And some of the scenes that you're talking about, John is actually seeing into heavens, and it has not yet come down to earth yet. So there's an already not yet aspect to this of John is seeing the worship taking place right now. Just like you know, Jesus said, like when, when we die right now, we're kind of in this kind of waiting area in heaven without our bodies, waiting. And then once he comes back and starts this process of making all things new, we're reunited with our bodies. And, and we come back down to be on earth and to be part of this recreation. So as you read these things, yeah, there, there's never a one-to-one -one correlation. You kind of have to trace these themes and see what, what's under this theme here. If that makes sense. Does that help? Sort of? Okay. So, so we've traced another theme. Remember, we traced this theme of redemption and water through Ezekiel's temple and stuff a couple weeks ago or a month ago at this point. You know, we've traced the theme of God's presence just really quickly. We went from Revelation back to Leviticus, now to Ezekiel. There's this theme of God's presence in the Bible. Now, I want to see if we can use the concepts of a biblical theology that we've learned together and in the next 20 minutes and its tools to see if we can do this with a very familiar biblical story, okay? Here we go. Let's get practical. 1 Samuel 17. This is a familiar story, so I'm going to read it fast, Okay. So now the Philistines gathered their armies for battle, and they were gathered at Succoth, which belongs to Judah, and encamped between Succoth and Azekah, at, at big name. And Saul and the men of Israel were gathered and encamped in the valley of Elah, and they drew up the line of battle against the Philistines. And the Philistines stood at the mountain on one side, and Israel stood at the mountain on the other side, with the valley between them. And there came out from the camp of Philistines a champion named Goliath of Gath, whose height was six cubits and a span. And he had a helmet of bronze on his head, and he was armed with a coat of mail. And the weight of the coat was 5,000 shekels of bronze. He's really tall, and his armor's really heavy. And he had the bronze armor on his legs, and a javelin of bronze slung between his shoulders. The shaft of his spear was like a weaver's beam, and his spear's head weighed 600 shekels of iron. And his shield-bearer went before him. He stood and shouted to the ranks of Israel, Why have you come out to draw up for battle? Am I not a Philistine? And are you not servants of Saul? Choose a man for yourself, and let him come down to, to me." Okay, so 
If he is able to fight with me and kill me, then we will be your servants. But if I prevail against him and kill him, then you shall be our servants and serve us. And the Philistines said, I defy the ranks of Israel this day. Give me a man that may fight together. When Saul and all Israel heard these words of the Philistine, they were dismayed and and greatly afraid. Okay, so that's where we are in the text. What happens next takes a long time to say, so I'm just going to summarize it up. David shows up with food for his older brothers. Goliath pops off again, just like he does here. And then David responds in verse 26. And David said to the men who stood by him, What shall be done for the man who kills this Philistine and takes away the reproach of Israel? For who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? So, you know the story, hopefully. Saul piles on his armor onto David, and David's like, you can't fight in this stuff. He refuses the armor, so he gets the stones, and he goes, and he faces Goliath. Verse 45, then David said to the Philistines, you come to me with a sword and a spear with a javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. This day the Lord will deliver you into my hand, and I will strike you down and cut off your head. I will give the dead bodies of the host of the Philistines this day to the birds of the air and to the wild beasts of the earth, that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel, and that all this assembly may know that the Lord saves not with the sword and spear, for the battle is the Lord's, and he will give you into our hand. We know the story, but it's it's great writing, so we're going to read it. David put his hand into his bag, and he took out a stone, and he slung it, and he struck the Philistine on his forehead, and he fell on his face to the ground. So David prevailed and struck the Philistine and killed him. There was no sword in the hand of David. Then David ran and stood over the Philistine and took his sword and drew it out of his sheep and killed him and cut off his head with it. When the Philistines saw their champion was dead, they fled. And the men of Israel and Judah rose with a shout and pursued the Philistines. And the people of Israel came back from chasing the Philistines. They plundered their camp. Okay. Give me the typical understanding. Third grade Sunday school. Go. Come on. Little boy killed the big giant, okay? What do you take home from that? Battle was the Lord's, okay? Well, what do we tell our little urchins in Sunday school? Yeah, y'all, y'all know where I'm going. You know where I'm playing, huh? Okay. I got it. I got it. Okay. Well, I'll, I'll give you a hint. I love the group Casting Crowns. I do. I, I, I don't know if they're even still around in contemporary or formerly contemporary Christian music. But you remember for the movie Facing the Giants, about what, 15 years ago, they had that great song called Voice of Truth? Totally captures the usual Sunday school understanding. Here's how it goes, right? Oh, what I would do to have the kind of strength it takes to stand before a giant with just a sling and a stone. Surrounded by the sound of a thousand warriors shaking in their armor, wishing they'd have had the strength to stand. But the giant's calling out my name and he laughs at me, reminding me of all the times I've tried before and failed. All right, so what are they saying? What are they saying? How are they summarizing this story? Okay. Do something courageous for God. Take it upon yourself. Right, go face down your giant. How many have heard the phrase, go face your giant? Come on, come on. I'm not asking if you've said it. Okay, if you, have you heard it? And all y'all can put your hands up. Okay, okay, you have. If you've been in church world for more than like 18 seconds, you've heard that. Okay, and okay, you know it. Okay, so casting crowns ver- in this version, okay, who or what is the giant? What's Goliath in this typical understanding? A challenge, a temptation, right? Something scary you're supposed to go do for God. Okay? Who is David then in that typical understanding? You're David. That's right. Of course, we're, it's the main character. Of course, we're the main character, right? Because the Bible's about us. Duh. Right? Okay. <laughs> right? What else? He tried and failed. That's right. You got to go try again. That giant's making fun of you. You got to go do it again. Right? So get out there and believe harder. Try to be more faithful and courageous like David. Come on, dig down and find your inner David. You can do it. Right? But review time. Who is the Bible about according to the Bible? Jesus. That's right. Jesus said it's all about me. And then he goes back and shows them. Right? 
He's either telling the truth or he's delusional. You got to pick, right? Okay, it's about him, all right? Okay, so literal interpretation. Let's, we have to ask the question, what genre is this? Is this poetry? Is this a song? Is this a historical account? Okay, first Samuel's history. Okay, very good, very good. It's a historical account. That's right. Okay. Actual events. So a literal interpretation means as it's written. So it's written as actual events. Okay. So is this direct verbal prophecy then? Remember that tool? Is this, are we clearly reading this going, oh, yeah, this is talking about something future? Okay, I would say no. Yeah, I don't, I don't see that. Okay. How about warring seas? Remember that? The seed of the serpent is going to crush the seed of... The seed of the woman, or right, or, sorry, the seed of the crushing the serpent, and we see this conflict. Is, is, maybe, maybe that's part of the conflict, maybe? I, see, I heard no, I hear a little bit. Could be applied. Okay, let's apply it. How could it be applied? Well, let's work backwards. In order for there to be a Jesus, there has to be a Mary and a Joseph. In order for there to be a Mary and a Joseph, what does there have to be? There has to be a David, right? And so if Goliath wins here, is there going to be a David? Okay, so there could be some warring seeds there, right? The Goliath could absolutely be a champion sent forth by the seed of the serpent to stop the he of Genesis 3.15. Okay, yeah, maybe, maybe warring seeds is how we understand this. Okay, how about typology? Could it be typology? Remember, typology is the reality is yet to come. The impression is here that we see. So is this maybe, could David or could Goliath be a type of something? Could David be a type of something? Okay, yeah, absolutely, Okay. What do we think? Could this be a foreshadowing of a coming reality? This means yes, this means no. Okay, yes, it could be. Okay, well, then let's, let's go with typology, maybe, and let's work this out. Could this be perhaps about great David's greater son? Okay, let's work it out. If so, then who is David, or what's David a type of? Christ. So David... So, Sorry, y'all, we're not David, right? D David is a type of Christ, so this is Christ, okay? Who's Goliath? Could he be a type of something or somebody? The enemy, Satan, death, sin. He could be a type for all of those things. Remember, you're doing typology. It's going to almost feel like allegory, except you have inspired things in the text telling you it's okay to do this. You're not just making it up. Has Jesus ever made a connection between him and David? A lot, yeah. Okay, so you get to do this, all right? Okay, so following along that, we've got Goliath, instead of just being some challenge, Goliath could be sin, death, Satan, okay? Who or what are the scared soldiers? There we go. This is where we are. We're the scared soldiers, right? We're the ones going, I do not have the resources for this. And you know what is a very appropriate response in that situation? Fear, okay? You're, you're supposed to be scared before death and sin and Satan. Who is, okay, no, we didn't quite get into his role, but if you read the text, you'll see this. Who is Saul? Could Saul be a type for something? This is where it gets fun. Saul is a type for the law. He was ordained of God, but not able to defeat the ultimate warrior. But a champion under Saul or under the law, no longer restricted by the law, the armor, fulfills it. He steps out in faith and defeats sin and death. Because what the law was powerless to do, Jesus did. What Saul was powerless to do, David did. Yeah. What happened to the Hebrew army? Let's keep going. What happened to the Hebrew army? They're empowered, yeah, all of a sudden they're chasing. And how did it end? It ended with them, what? Having abundant, abundant blessing. They plundered these people. They went from living in fear, like, we're going to die, our children are going to be slaves, and our nation's going to cease to exist, to, woohoo, we're rich, and we have no more enemies. Right? They went out in David's victory and plundered the other army. Just like in Christ, we have power in all things, and the gates of hell will not prevail against us. And remember, gates don't attack. Gates are attacked, right? When he says the gates of hell will not prevail, he is calling on us to charge them. 
It's, it's sin and death and demons and the forces of Antichrist who are behind their gates cowering in fear at the, at the hordes of Christians and who are saying the gates of hell will not prevail. See, follow this model. That was an easy one, I know. But follow this model. Ask these questions as you read Scripture. Especially stop yourself and say, wait, am I making myself the main character? if you are, you need to be careful. You know, you got to be careful. Because like that word Y-O-U in the New Testament, that's almost always plural. So it's really not about you. It's about us. It's about y'all. It's about our union in Christ. And so he says, you you have strength in all things. Well, because Christ has strength in all things and you're in union to him. And so yes, y'all have strength in all things. Right? So always try to remember, we, we are always trying to make ourselves the main character. In every story we encounter. You, you know, we, we do that. Right? And we do that in the Bible. So we're trying to make Jesus the main character instead of us. That's the, you start, so if you start asking those questions, because the Bible is not about us, and we, we default to making the Bible about us. But who's the Bible about? It's about Jesus. And if you start from there, then you can start to work some things out. Okay, does anybody want to push back on this? I know I just ruined David. Sorry, sorry. Now, having said that, that is the primary big picture biblical meaning of David and Goliath. Jesus comes and defeats the ultimate enemy that you are powerless to defeat, and in him you have the victory. Having said that, in Jesus, you can look to David as an example and a model and be inspired and say, yes, I want to have a great faith and try scary things too. You can absolutely do that without being unfaithful. As long as you remember that that's not the primary, it's the secondary. Does that make sense? Does that make sense? Okay. Hmm? David blew it a lot. David blew it a lot. Yeah, so if you're going to identify with David's victories, you need to identify with David's failures too. Exactly. So, all right. Yes. Is that approach of primary and secondary, everything's about Jesus, true of every story in Scripture? Ah, oh, yes, with an if, no, with a but. Um, <laughs> I'm going to say yes. Faithfully go through and make it about Jesus first, and then because, because every command in Scripture is there because God wants us to obey. And so he empowers us to obey. And so, you know, you could outline any story in the Bible as here's what God says. Here's why you failed at it. Here's why that brings God's wrath and curse. Here's how Jesus fulfilled it. And then the one we always forget to add, here now is how you can fulfill it in Jesus. So as long as we get to that, that final point of in Jesus, we can do this too. Then I would say yes. Does that answer Hold on, Thomas first. Sorry. Could, could, this may be silly, but could, could the stone be used to represent the resurrection of Jesus? So could the stone itself stone the roll away? The whole stone concept? I, stuff like that is, again, I'm sorry, the question was, like, could we, could we see representation in the stone itself? Could it be, you know, some of the earliest church, um, in the ancient church, and the earliest church pastors, actually, it was very famous. It was a, it was a kind of a, it was a thing to preach about how the five books of the Pentateuch, the first five books of the Bible, represented the five stones. So you want to be careful because when you're doing stuff like that, it, it, unless you can find some warrant theologically or linguistically, you're kind of getting into some subjective allegory. So you want to be careful. Now, in, in your own, if you're teaching class, you could say something along the lines like, you know, I like to think of this, like for me, the stones would be like the resurrection. Sure. But you, you want to say, but I don't know if that's completely in the text. As long as you caveat, I think you're being fine. But we can find, you know, Jesus claimed to be the greater Goliath. We know that in him we have the victory. We know that Saul, as the ordained king, it was his job to take on Goliath, and he couldn't or wouldn't, just like Paul tells us the law is powerless. So you know, we can make those connections. So, uh, Gene. Yeah, he said, he, he, he was told, I was told this too, that, you know, when you read the Bible, to make it more personal, insert your name instead of just reading you. 
And that has some merit as long as you do it like with nuance. And the nuance, maybe the nuance should be that instead of you should, you should insert the net, your name and a comma in Jesus. You know, so God has blessed Gene in Jesus with strength in all things. You know, maybe that, maybe that will help. Or else we'll start reading about us and we'll start getting into a try harder, do more, be more as, as opposed to rest in Christ. Any other questions? Yes. Um, so the question is, how did, how did the early Christians put together the, prom, the continued promise of everlasting life with God coming down and dwelling? Yeah. So I would say that that actually shows how it's supposed to be this kind of unified thing because Paul called death going to sleep. You know, when he was, the people in Thessalonians wrote him saying, we're concerned about people who've already died. They thought Jesus would come back. And he's like, no, those who have fallen asleep will rise and meet him. So the, the New Testament church never saw death as anything but temporary. There was always an, an understanding that Jesus is going to come back and the dead will be raised to this everlasting life. And so Paul talks about, um, probably in 2 Timothy because he's dying, about how he, he, he's anxious to go be with Christ, but he doesn't want to be found naked, separated from his body, because as a good Jew, he recognizes that's, that's unnatural. Body and spirit go together. He was a bad Greek, but a good Jew. And he's like, I don't want those things to be separate. I don't want to be naked, but to be with Christ is better. And so theologians have pointed to that in other places as this idea of, well, we're separated from our body. Our bodies are in the ground. But somehow some essential part of us is with Christ immediately when we die. But then the promise of everlasting life is we're going to be put back together. And that's really where life begins, the everlasting part. Until then, we're kind of in a temporary separated in this unnatural state, not in our body. Is that kind of... Okay. All right, we got two minutes left. Any other questions? Actually, we have 90 seconds. Mike's really strict, so... Yes. Yeah, because like the, you know, it depends on what you mean by heaven because there, there are places where heaven is clearly in context of this temporary thing where believers are immediately, like Christ told, Christ told the, the guy on the cross next to him, today you'll be with me in paradise. So there's something about immediacy, but there's also this something's going to come back and make it better, more robust, make it a new ongoing thing. So... Most people haven't read Dante. Most people aren't rooted in medieval li literature, but we stand on the shoulders of those who've come before us. And after the, the Middle Ages, Western culture kind of just had this as a baseline assumption of spirit good, matter bad. And so when we're singing about heavenly things, and we must mean some sort of spiritual reality. So it's kind of just in the water that we breathe. So we, we don't breathe water. We don't, you, you meant what I need to say. Yeah. <laughs> Does that help? It depends on the context of the passage, you know, because, yeah. Think of it more relationally than geographically. Yeah, she's asking, does God keep leaving and coming back? Think of it more relationally than geographically. So like, you have, you have, we're, we're alienated from God because of the fall. And so there are things that God does to overcome that alienation, such as the tabernacle, such as the temple, such as Christ. We also see at several times where God does give his presence by his spirit, but it's always a temporary thing. They're flooded with the Holy Spirit, and then it leaves. 
and, you, and we can see they clearly have a deficit. They have a deficit of courage, have a deficit of faith, they have a deficit of endurance because they have no spirit in dwelling them. And so, yeah, there is this chronological aspect to God's grace that there are certain benchmarks that have to take place in order for it to all come together. And so it, you read the Old Testament, it, it does yield itself superficially to almost looks like it's no grace. Where if you sin once, God's gone. But you have to like really dig into the text, you know, God's gracious presence is there. And they're over and over again rejoicing in God's grace. So they're receiving something as grace. But what we have in the fullness of Christ is so much more and it's much more robust and permanent. So I'll continue to take your questions. I'll stand up here, but we've got to get the sanctuary up. It's time we close prayer. Father God, thank you for your grace. Thank you for your Bible. Thank you, Lord, that it is so rich and deep. And even those of us in the room who have studied the Bible for decades can find new ahas. Because your grace is so rich. Thank you, Lord. Continue to show us the richness of your word and the richness of you. In Jesus' name.